Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Natty Hoffman and I'm a member of the board of the Vilna Shul, a Jewish community center in Boston, located in the oldest synagogue building remaining in the city. More than 700 of you registered for this truly international event. In addition to participants all across the US and Canada, we also have people joining us from Mexico, Thailand, the UK, across Europe, and also Japan. Sugihara's actions saved thousands of people whose descendants are now spread across the world. In fact, many of the people participating tonight are descendants of Sugihara's survivors. We also have in the audience some of Sugihara's family members. Sugihara taught us a lesson that is universal, a lesson about courage, empathy, and how the choices of a single individual made a difference that has lasted many years after he's gone. About one year ago, the Vilna Schul showcased the film Persona Non Grata in its newly renovated building. It was a sold out event and the last one we had in person before we closed our doors to the public due to the pandemic. But COVID-19 had a silver lining. Our virtual audience for this and other programs has grown much larger than we ever could imagine. And we're happy that we can bring this film to so many people. We hope that you have a chance to take a look at the many other online programs we offer. When I watched the film Persona Non Grata in Tokyo at the end of 2015, I was surprised to see that the theater was packed. World War II is a painful topic in Japan and it is not often discussed. It is a hard conversation for American and Japanese people to have. Also, Sugihara engaged in civil disobedience, a quality that is discouraged in Japan, a country that prides itself on harmony and order. Yet Sugihara's story has generated intense interest across Japan and has made it easier for us to talk about disobedience as a moral choice. We'd like to thank our sponsors, the Japanese Consulate of Boston and Basis Technology. We also want to thank our many partners, the Japan Society of Boston, Facing History and Ourselves, Boston Jewish Film, the JCC of the North Shore, the Consulate General of Lithuania in New York, and the Sugihara Diplomats for Life Foundation. I'd like to extend a special thank you to the JCC in Tokyo, which has partnered with us and for, from where many people are joining us today. Today's event will start with a short Havdalah service, which Rabbi Mark Sokol will explain. Then Stacy Rosenthal from Facing History in Ourselves will interview Persona Non Grata film director Chalin Gluck and Sugihara House senior researcher and deputy chairman of Sugihara Diplomats for Life Foundation, Lina Svenslauskas. We will leave the last 20 minutes for your questions. Please type your questions into the Q&A box. And now Rabbi Mark Sokol, Executive Director of the Jewish Community Centers of Greater Boston will lead us in Havdalah service. Thank you so much, Natty. Um, before I begin the uh, Havdalah service, just a, uh, a special welcome to uh, Dalit Ballenhorn. Dalit is the newly appointed executive director of the Vilna. She will be starting at the end of February. Uh, welcome uh, Dalit. I can hear the thunderous applause literally around the world. Welcome you to this new role at the Vilna and we are excited to have you uh, become part of the family and the leadership of this uh, great treasure. Uh, the Habdalah service is a service that marks transition a transition from uh, Shabbat to the rest of the days of the week, from the Sabbath, a time of pause and reflection, to the days of the week of days of doing, from the holy of the Sabbath to the not yet holy of the days of the week. The Havdalah service uh, includes, of course, a bit of sadness because there's a beautiful Jewish tradition that says on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath, we are joined by an extra soul that hangs out with us for the whole time during Shabbat. And here at Havdalah, we say goodbye to that soul until next Shabbat, until next week. But Havdalah is also a time of great joy of the opportunity uh, that lies in the week ahead. Uh, as many of you know, Jewish uh, tradition is meticulous about uh, transition, attention to detail, uh, just like many of us saw here on Wednesday in the USA, uh, however, tonight there will be no grand fireworks display at the end. Transition is a time of great light and of great hope and very imp so important in Jewish tradition that we mark it every single week. First, uh, I will offer uh, an opening short prayer 
that affirms our relationship uh, with God, the source of all creation, and then a few blessings, the blessings of Havdalah, of course, with props. And those props include a, a glass of wine, a cup of wine, wine for the sweetness of Shabbat and for the potential that lies ahead. Also spices, in this case, clove spices, the sense of smell is so powerful. It awakens memory, uh, food, experience, places, all through smell. And smell, of course, calms and quiets our nerves. And final symbol of Havdalah, this beautiful braided candle, this fusion of all of our creative impulses in which we will, in the light of the candle, see our hands and our fingernails. Our hands, what we use to embrace and to reach out and to create, and our fingernails, because they are always growing, always growing just like us. So we turn now uh, using a very uh, simple tune to the uh, Havdalah service, beginning with our opening prayer. Recognizing you as God of my deliverance, I will live in faith and not in fear. For you, Adonai God, are my strength and my inspiration, and you bring me salvation. May we joyfully draw water from the well of deliverance. Deliverance is from God, from Adonai. May your blessings always be with your people, Adonai. You are with us, God of Jacob. You protect us. Praise is the person who trusts in you. Adonai, you are the deliverer. You surely respond when we call. As it says in our sources for the Jews, there was light and joy and happiness as it was then. May it so be for us now. We raise this cup of wine. Let this cup I raise be a cup of deliverance as I speak of God's essence and salvation. And the blessings of, of Abdullah with the following tune, if you please know it, sing along at home while you're on mute. <laughs> Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei minei v'samim Borei minei v'samim La 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 Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Bore me ore aish, bore me ore aish, la 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 Aulam Hamabdil ben Kodesh Lecho ben Or Lecho Oshech Ben Yisrael Leamim Ben Yom Hashvi Lesheshet Yame Hamase Baruchat Adonai Hamabdil ben Kodesh Lecho Lai, 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 lai. And now we beseech Eliyahu, the prophet, to pre please herald the coming of the Messiah, the days of perfect peace in our time. Eliyahu, we need you. We need the Messiah now more than ever. Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu Hatishbi, Eliyahu, Eliyahu. Eliyahu Hagiladi, Bimhera Biyamenu, Yahavu Eleinu, Imashiach Ben David, 
Imashiach ben David, Shavua Tov, a good week, 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 Shavua Tov, blessings, peace, and a wonderful week ahead, and a wonderful evening ahead for all of us, the Chaim, and let us all say, Amen. I would like to end now by beginning our program by introducing someone very special, Stacy Rosenthal from Facing History. Stacy will moderate the conversation. Stacy is a program associate on the Jewish education team at Facing History and Ourselves, where she has facilitated workshops and other professional development opportunities for educators in Jewish settings all over the country for the last four years. She brings to Facing History a master's in anthropology, which she combines with deep knowledge of Holocaust history, former teaching experience, and passion for societal reform through education. Stacy lives in Hudson, Massachusetts, but she's currently working. Uh, we can't tell because it's dark out, but we know that Stacy is now working from beautiful Martha's Vineyard. Stacy, I turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Mark, for that introduction and for inviting Facing History to be part of this conversation. Um, for those of you that don't know, Facing History and Ourselves is an educational nonprofit. And our mission is to use history and stories like Sugihara's to encourage young people and students to think about the worlds around them in their own lives. Um, and I personally have worked with schools and students on Sugihara's story and on projects related to him. And so I'm really excited excited to be part of today's conversation. And as Kate had mentioned early in her introduction, we are so grateful um, and, and um, delighted to be joined by Chellen and Linus. Um, Chellen, welcome back to Vilna. For those of you that don't know, Chellen Gluck is the director of Persona Non Grata and was at the Vilna Schule in person last January before the pandemic. So it's great to be back in conversation. Um, and we're also joined by Linus Venschklauskas, who's the deputy chairman of the Sugihara Diplomats for Life Foundation is in Kaunas and a professional tour guide and researcher at the Sugihara House. Um, so again, we're so delighted to have you both and a special thanks to you, Linus. I know you're calling in from the middle of the night, your time. So special thanks to you for being here. Um, I, we sent out the film in advance of this. So for those of you that are already thinking about the story and have questions, there is a little Q and A button at the bottom of this Zoom screen and we encourage you to use it and ask questions throughout this night, which we're going to be keeping track of for the Q&A at the end. Um, but to start us off, I would like to hear a little bit about both of you. And so Chellen, maybe you could tell us about how you came to making this film. And Linus, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you came to working at the Sugihara Diplomats for Life Foundation and maybe a little bit about the foundation itself. Chellen, would you like to start? Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Stacy, and thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone. It's, it's so great to be back at the Vilna again, you know, if in spirit, if, if at least in spirit, if not physically, it's so wonderful. The, the, uh, the event that we had last year was fantastic. Like I said, it was, we had over 200 people and I'm told there's over a thousand joining us today, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, welcome everybody, uh, just I'll make this really quick. How did I come about doing this film? Well, I actually had read about it from on a book called The Fugu Plan that Rabbi, Rabbi Tokayer had written many, and I was, I was given this book many years ago. And obviously I grew up in Kobe, Japan, and there were mentions of it. I'd be lying if I said that nobody talked about it, but we really didn't talk about it. But when you now go back and, and re-examine, the conversation did come up and I remember somebody's aunt or somebody's, you know, Baba telling us, yeah, there were a lot of Jewish people came through here, but that was about all we knew about the story uh, until I read the Fugu plan and it all started to make sense. And I did a film called Over the Last Samurai, which is a, a film about the American invasion of Saipan for, uh, the product, for NTV Productions, who are the producers of this film um, about eight years ago. And I met... Uh, I met Mr. Karasawa, who plays Sugihara in our film on the film on on that film, 
and he we we immediately became friends and he and I were talking about doing something together we've been working on several projects and all of a sudden NTV came to us and said uh to actually said to Takara Sasan he goes um listen we're thinking of doing this for the 70th anniversary you know post-war anniversary um and would you be interested in playing Sugihara and he goes yeah but that means that I would be overseas and speaking mostly in English and he goes, if I'm doing that, then there's only one person I want directing and that would be Chellen. And he goes, oh, well, don't worry about it. By the way, we've been talking to him about it as well. So that was uh, serendipitous, shall we say. And, and uh, everything started quite in sync. And we moved on. And uh, that's how I became involved. And that's how I did it. I mean, it, it was great because there's a lot of things. I'm half Japanese. I'm half Jewish. I grew up in Kobe. You know, there's just a lot of things came together. Um, and here we are. Excellent. Thank you. Linus, what about you? What's some of your background? Okay, so first of all, thank you for the invitation, this wonderful event. Uh, speaking about Sugihara Diplomats for Life Foundation, uh, first important message maybe should be that I am coming from a, a complex part of the world. <laughs> at least it, it is middle of the night at the moment, uh, for example, or speaking more seriously, and you're men mentioning uh, Vilna, it's very nice to hear uh, this 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 name, uh, but uh, Vilna or Vilnius, first of all, associates me with uh, Vilnius, our historical capital city. And that's already part of Sukihara story. Uh, Suki, uh, Sukihara diplomats for Life Foundation itself uh, was established in 1999. Uh, why to establish uh, Sugihara Foundation in, well, uh, to, 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 from some point of view in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Maybe not everyone knows where Konas is <laughs> or Lithuania as well. Uh, uh, my argue here would be that refugees who are going to Japan and later Shanghai and some other places also were going as if to the middle of nowhere because they not everyone knew uh, where uh, uh, these these locations are. Uh, so the uh, simple reason because in 1939, 1940 in the house we are now operating, Sukihara Diplomats for Life Foundation was a historical Japanese uh, consulate. At that time, Kaunas was provisional capital city because historical uh, capital city Vilna or Vilnius was occupied, as we Lithu Lithuanians are saying, um, by Poland. So Kaunas was the, the central city of, of, of Lithuania. That's why all the embassies were located there. Uh, uh, around 28 different uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, representative offices were working there, including a Japanese consulate, which was uh, opened uh, relatively late uh, in uh, at the beginning of November 1939. So history was present there. Again, uh, uh, as your organization, Stacy and Sukihara Diplomats for Life Foundation is uh, NGO. So we are working from our, our uh, we are working on our own. It depends on us how we manage, how we sustain ourselves. It is not the best time for the foundation <laughs> at the moment because of the pandemic and crisis. But nevertheless, the idea was to take this historical uh, place, knowing already uh, Sukihara story and it was not very much spread in Lithuania and still it is not so spread. We have more Japanese visitors than Lithuanian visitors, for, for example, at our museum. But to take this this story, uh, but the title of the of the foundation organization is Sukihara Diplomats for Life Foundation. That means that we are trying to research on a wider perspective and side by side was working also uh, in Kaunas, uh, honorary consul of the Netherlands, Jans Weinterdijk, who was uh, issuing some another uh, papers so documents which were essential for those uh, Jews who were trying to, 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 to uh, leave the region. And my personal involvement, first of all, from, from uh, volunteering activities, I, I, I have this honorable position as a deputy chair of the, of the, of the foundation, but last four years, I'm already working at the, at, at the foundation. Finally, I got paid <laughs> for my activities. Uh, and well, we are doing some kind of researches. We are trying to renew our uh, exhibitions because again uh, historians as i am uh, usually i am i am calling them quite uh, nasty uh, people because they would say no this is not like this it was a little bit dif different uh, we should uh, consider a different angle so i i i i i i, um, I am doing some some researches on sukiharas uh, or refugees a general uh, story and uh, our one of the ideas 
was also while working within 20 years that a little bit uh, in the story Lithuania is a little bit lacking so now we are trying to put a little bit in Lithuania's context where Sukihara came how the country looked like and, and, and things like that. That's great thank you for sharing all of that that's wonderful to know all of that. Um, we're going I, we're going to get into more um, I guess narrower questions of the film but before we do that um, Sugihara was really a truly remarkable and also com complex individual and his role at this time is of course complex as we see throughout the film um, and so Linus uh, and this is a two-part question again directed to each of you um, Linus when you think about Sugihara's life overall what surprises you the most and what did you learn in your research that really blew you away um, and Chalin, there were so many different artistic decisions that had to be made when creating this film, um, including, I was very interested in your use of actual footage with, of course, the film narrative blended in. So um, in general, in your artistic process, can you talk about that and the decisions that had to be made about what to include and ultimately what not to include? Okay, while 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 researching uh, Sukihara, reading about about uh, Sukihara, uh, it was an exceptional person, a, exceptional as Japanese for some 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 parts which were already already mentioned of his uh, behavior. Uh, that's one thing, and, and another thing, definitely very smart, very intelligent, very educated uh, uh, person, and uh, well, uh, celebrating, cherishing life. Uh, 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 understanding believing that life uh, should be celebrated because because well we are we are here on earth to 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 to, to share our our i don't know uh, uh, love our experiences uh, to communicate another another feature which was also interesting that definitely it was a brave man a brave man and a little bit um uh, uh, how to say uh uh uh, uh maybe provocative if it is not the, the, the best word, but it, the other is not coming to, to, to my mind. Two, two examples. Again, some, some biographers of, of Chuna Sugihara is, is said that he was a very communicative person. Again, to some kind of stereotypes that may be not uh, the, the most visible part of Japanese uh, stereotype, let's say. So here he, he was also an exception. Some, some sources, some researchers uh, uh, said that he was able even to overdrunk uh, Russians when he was working in the diplomatic positions in Manchuria and something like that. Uh, so this is also an, an exception and it made proud or good company of, of Sukihara. That's why he was well accepted before he <laughs> did something in Manchuria and became persona non grata by, by the Russians as well as well. This is a strong guy. He is, he, he is a nice, uh, he is a nice fellow. While working in his diplomatic positions, what he was being, uh, what he has been doing here in, in, in Kaunas in Lithuania, uh, he was uh, tightly collaborating with Polish underground. Poland at that time was at the war uh, with the Nazi uh, Germany and Soviet uh, 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 Russia, Soviet Union. So while working with these uh, uh, clandestine uh, Polish organizations, he was using his uh, diplomatic uh, mails to transfer uh, Polish underground messages, uh, messages into the Western uh, countries. So at this point, if he had been caught, he was risking very much. But nevertheless, nevertheless, he 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 took this opportunity. He knew the price, of course, but nevertheless, he was he was a very brave uh, man. And of course, uh, he was thinking uh, uh, unconditionally. He was working in a Japanese diplomatic uh, service, but at the same time, he was uh, thinking unconventionally. Because at a very uh, important moment, he decided, well, I should do this what he uh, has done and again from 28 different legations in Kaunas only Japanese and uh, Netherlands uh, uh, ambassadors let's call them uh, opened opened uh, the doors for, for for the refugees saying that yes if we can do something we are uh, doing this at the, at the very moment and we do not know if that will help you but at, at the moment we are doing uh, whatever we can so usually when I am summing up I am saying that uh, the right persons uh, in the right time and in a very difficult circumstances. Hmm. Great. 
Great. That's one of our questions that we'll, I want to pick your brain about a little deeper in a minute. But Chellen, first, I, I would love to hear from you. Um, that's a tough one. It's, it's a very short but very broad question. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Trace. Um, what happened, with, we, what we did is, that, I mean, there have been a lot of books written about Sugihara. Uh, but there's not an autobiography. I guess the closest thing that we can get con called an autobiography would, would be the book written by his wife, Hikiko. Mm. Uh, but we actually came across a book, a research paper, an expend extended research paper, I guess, is the best way to call it, by a gentleman named Shiraishi, who was a Japanese uh, foreign service officer, not at the same time, obviously, in the 70s. And it's the, I guess the closest translation would be um, Sugihara, the most excellent intelligence officer. And it took and and it took a lot of a, a a broad history, and it and and it and he also borrowed from a lot of you know event that, that accounts that have been written or told, and we decided to use that because it was the most neutral of everything that we found. I mean, it was it was a paper. It started out as a paper, and and, and it wasn't it wasn't overly laudatory, and it also wasn't condemning. You know, I mean, it was in that sense it was very neutral. So we use that as as our storyline. And as you say, what do we include? What don't we include? I mean, I know that, you know, that the, some people find the first 15 minutes of the film very confusing. Uh, we tried to explain it as best we could, but, you know, we had to start with somewhere other than Lithuania. What made, what brought Sugihara to Europe? What made him persona non grata? And that was our, that was our, that was our intention was to try and explain his background uh, in the beginning and carry and carry on is yeah and what did what to include what not to include boy when we first cut the film it was over three hours long and it's still fairly long uh two hours and 20 minutes and they wanted us to cut even more but we tried we cut it down to about an hour and 59 and all of a sudden it started to make not make any sense at all because we had taken too much of it out um so what we tried to do was just follow a timeline and what and and to be fair, to, we had to tell the story of Sugihara as realistically and as close to the truth as possible. But to be fair, if someone came to you and said, "Make a movie about a guy who spent 29 days holed up in a consulate writing visas," you know that's not a three-hour movie. That's not a two-hour movie. It's about a 29-minute movie, maybe. So we, we tried to make it as entertaining as possible while not straying too far from the truth. Mm. And, uh, you know, when the film first opened in Tokyo, it's one of my favorite photos, you know, in, in the world is like we were up there on the, on, on the marquee and on the left is Star Wars, on the right was James Bond and we were right in the middle. And so, I mean, I figure we were in good company as far as entertainment was concerned. So, I mean, it, it is a fine balancing act about trying to remain entertaining uh, tr and trying to remain as close to the truth as possible. We cut, we put back, we cut, we put back. I, I don't know how else to explain it. Um, you know, we had parallel, as, 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 as those who saw the film, you know, will, will have noticed, we had parallel lines, parallel stories going on, trying to explain a different part of Sugihara's life and Sugihara's history with the actions or his interactions with certain people, you know, the refugee mother, the his assistant, uh, his best friend in Japan, or his, his, his eventually his brother in law in Japan. So that was the way that we dealt with trying to put in as much as possible. And I, you know, I'm lost. I'm at a loss there because at that, I mean, it took us a year to figure it out even after we shot it. So I hope that makes sense. It definitely makes sense. No, thank you so much for that. Um, um, I, moving on a little bit, um, at Facing History, our approach is to use or to think about identity and in general, how we as human beings are all influenced by the communities that we live in, our upbringings, um, our, our beliefs, etc. cetera. Um, and so in that vein, I want both of you, or I wanna ask both of you to think about this, um, how our religious, our ethnic and our national identity shape the way that we construct what we would consider a moral responsibility for other people. Um, how that applies to each of you and how you see that applying to Sugihara um, specifically. And another way to think about this question actually, um, that we see throughout the film that Sugihara gets pushback 
from several people on, on his attempt at writing visas and his interest in helping. And um, I want to ask you, I guess, or to think about this in terms of the circumstances that might lead some people like Sugihara to take a risk and other people to not. And that's an open, whoever would like to go first. Chellen, go for it. Um, okay. You know, it's, it's, once again, it's easy to, to, to try and pin a reason for someone to have, for anyone to have done anything, right? I mean, Mother Teresa, why did she, what, what she do, what she, why did she do what she did? Well, she was following what, what she believed God wanted her to do, okay? In her case, it's a lot easier in, in some ways, because yes, she faced a lot of pushback and she faced a lot of hardships and all that, but her mission was clear. She was a nun and she did, she carried out her mission. Now, Sugihara was a diplomat, and above all, essentially diplomats are supposed to remain fairly neutral as far as, or at least not give away their hand, you know. Um, of course, they're supposed to carry out the, the, the biddings of their government, but at the same time, there is a grave responsibility that comes with that job, as we've noticed with, you know, even our own diplomats, there are times when you can't tow the company line, so to speak, you know, but what drives you to do that? I think the closest thing or the closest reason that I'd like to give and I'd like to believe is that it was just the humanity. I mean, that was the humanity in Sugihara himself that drove him to do the things that he did, his core beliefs, you know, of what was right and what was wrong. More importantly, what was wrong and what needed to be done to be righted. I mean, there are those who say it was because he had, you know, he had um, converted to, to Russian Orthodoxy and that he was following the words of God, okay? That to me is too simple an answer as well. It's too simplistic an answer. I think, why do, why does anybody do anything? You know, um, and and look, he did say, when somebody asked him, why did you do what you did? One of, one of the answers that he gave was, um, you know, I did disobey my government, but had I not done what I did, I would have been disobeying a greater power. Okay, is that, the God that we're talking about? Is that his God, the Christian God, whatever it is, I think it's basically, I'd like to, to reduce it to once again, to humanity. I mean, that was his core belief of doing what was right. You know, even in the face of incredible opposition. I'll leave it at that for the moment. I'm sure I can go back. I, I could talk about that for 45 minutes. Thanks, no, that's great. Okay, so it's it's a, a really difficult question. I, I will maybe approach from a, a more general perspective, uh, since uh, Chunya Sugihara is is uh, the righteous among the nations. So, quite 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 a number of those people uh, are uh, given this title by Yad Vashem, but no one, to my knowledge, uh, would give clear answer uh, why he or she has done this because I am a hero, because I'm an exceptional, something like that. Usually the reply would be at least from Lithuanian, let's say side, righteous among the nation. I was doing what I, I, I had to do because I, 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 I was a Catholic, I was a believer because this is my principles, because again, the life should be uh, cherished, the life should be treasured and, and uh, you should not be uh, uh, stay aside when something wrong is is, is happening. Having in mind and uh, having in mind and all the uh, risks. Uh, 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 on the other hand, speaking about uh, Chuina Sugihara and Jans Weinterberg, who were not uh, working together parallelly, which is also very important, uh, because later, while saving Jews and using some diplomatic efforts, uh, usually there were already some change of diplomat. And classical example here would be Raoul Wallenberg with the uh, support of the Swedish government with the backup from the United States of America and, and, and things like that. So these two uh, diplomats, gentlemen, uh, were a single individual, non-conformistic one, which is also very important. Another example in this context, uh, con uh, context uh, Sukihara issued within uh, 29 uh, days, if I, I remember correctly, Selin said, uh, 2,139 visas. On the same street, Vajganto Street in Kaunas, uh, nearby was a Swedish legation, a Swedish uh, embassy. And there, diplomats or bureaucrats, uh, if I may, were following the orders. That meant eight visas per day. 
uh, they were opening uh, the door, issuing eight visas, saying, thank you, we have done every, everything we could, please come tomorrow. Uh, another important thing here is, uh, uh, which I would like to underline, Sukihara was issuing his visas in Lithuania in the uh, summer of 1940, at mm -hmm. the moment when Lithuania was occupied by Soviet Union, by USSR. So first of all, those who were asking for uh, Sukihara's visas, they were escaping Soviet paradise or Soviet reality because uh, Soviets were quite anti-Semitic. Of course, they were not open anti-Semites, but at the same time, they were anti-religious, they were anti-nationalist, anti-Zionist, and quite a lot of persons who were moving with Sukihara's since Winterdijk's help. Uh, those persons, first of all, were of, of let's say, uh, Zionistic orientation or religious people. So this is also very important to remember Remember because, well, this usually I'm calling it post Holocaust uh, thinking puts Sukihara into this uh, Holocaust uh, 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 context. But what he was doing physically in summer of 1914 in Lithuania, it was a Soviet reality. Definitely, uh, Nazis came into Lithuania a year later, 90, summer 1941, and uh, around 90% of uh, local Jewish population were killed in Lithuania by Nazis and local collaborators. That's very important. So first of all, he was saving from Soviets, but eventually, and from, from Holocaust, I would would uh, um, uh, agree uh, on this uh, uh, on, the, on 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 this uh, uh, as well. Another thing in Sugihara's story, also uh, which is important to underline, he was saving first of all, or primarily. Uh, Polish uh, Jews, not local Lithuanians. If we would look to Sukihara's list, we would see that the plurality of them are of Polish citizens. Some Lithuanian passports, some United States uh, of America, some German passports as well. But nevertheless, he was saving uh, refugees or stateless Jewish uh, people uh, coming from occupied uh, Poland. And again, with, with a very short uh, period, such a great number of, of documents uh, uh, issued. Again, legal documents because forgeries functioned and, and things like that. Uh, this is a very, very long and complex uh, story. I would agree definitely with, with Selin, despite the, the very short uh, time. But if not the Soviets, and actually Sukihara was kicked out by the Soviets from, from Lithuania and at the beginning of September, if not the Soviets, so maybe not 2,139 visas, but 20,000 still, summer of 1941, because Sukihara was not leaving on his own. He was kicked out by the Soviets. Interestingly enough, uh, by the decree of Soviet Lithuania, of course, coordinated from Moscow, or all foreign legations uh, should be closed till the middle of August of 1940, uh, with four exceptions. Embassy of Great Britain, Embassy of the United States of America, Embassy of France. And they were arguing, and quite correctly, we are big entities. Look, we need time to pack the things to, to take care of our citizens and stuff like that. And they received prolongation till the uh, 5th of September. And th these three big embassies and small, tiny uh, Japanese consulate, because there was no stuff at all. There was only Sukihara family and local collaborators hired by Sukihara. But here I would say Sukihara personally made a lot of uh, 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 activities uh, in order to prolong at least for these two weeks to issue as many visas as possible on one hand. On the other hand, we should not forget that Sukihara was an uh, intelligence officer, let's say. Mm -hmm. He was gathering information. And this is, was an exceptional uh, situation in Lithuania. Soviets are coming, Nazis are uh, uh, nearby because Klaipeda or Memel, our uh, uh, port uh, city and areas uh, around were occupied by Nazis in, uh, before before Second World War started in the March 1939. So these two activities combination, but of course, priority to humanity, humanitarianism and helping people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's, I, I really appreciate all that information and this contrast between his actual in, intelligence work that he's collecting there, as well as the visas that he's I I issuing for people. Um, and that exact complexity is what we encourage our students to study about, about rescue behavior and why people chose to do what they did at this time and all the different situations that they were living under and the context that they were living under that created what they were able to do and what they weren't able to do. Um, and you actually, in your answer, addressed a lot of questions that are coming in in the chat box about Sugihara's story. So thank you for all of that information. And we are going to address the questions that people are raising um, in, in a minute. Um, I have one more question to ask formally as part of this panel. 
One of the unique characteristics about our particular curriculum that we put out is that at the end, we um, call the final chapter something called choosing to participate which encourages students to think about what they learn from people throughout history about what it means to be upstanders and how they can sort of think about that in relation to their own lives. So um, with that in mind, I want to ask you what you each have personally learned about um, this question of choosing to participate and Linus with the complexity that was involved, all of it. Like what have you learned about all of this? Um, and what message would you want the audience to take away from Sugihara's story when they think about upstander behavior? And again, whoever, Linus, do you wanna go first? Yeah, okay, I can do this. Well, uh, usually I, 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 am, I am summing up with, with, with a sentence uh, saying that uh, uh, one person matters. This is the, the, the most important message. Uh, despite the context, the, despite the complexities, the, the, this, despite uh, difficulties and, and uh, your environment, your personal individual decision is the most important. And this is the biggest responsibility for doing something. For not doing anything, it is easy to hide away because this is the regulation, because this is the hard situation, because uh, we have uh, some, some problems or something things like that and somehow you are you are hiding uh, uh, your your decision and individual well of course we had a, uh, to my mind uh, exceptional uh, uh, person but at the same time as i said he was not positioning himself as a as a hero that look now i will do something that that what that will solve all the problems on the contrary to my knowledge he was issuing visas constantly permanently working uh, 14 hours per day but at the same time saying look i am doing what i can do at the moment but i do not know if that will help you i am wishing you the very best luck uh, and i hope that you will be able to use uh, uh, these these uh, uh, documents so my short message is that the individual decision is the most important despite all the all the all the contexts thank you well i mean you know linus has basically said it i mean if i were to say two things it said you know uh it's been said a, ma a million times but everyone can make a difference one person can make a difference a huge difference and the other thing for me that's important is, you know, silence is complicit. You're being complicit when you when you witness atrocities, when you witness things that are wrong and you stand by and you remain silent and you watch it happen around you to, to people around you, you know, even to people you don't know, it doesn't matter. Things happen in front of you. It's wrong. Don't stay silent. I mean, silence is complicit, you know, is, is being complicit. I think those are the two things. And I think, you know, both of those things drove, I'm, I'm not sure that Sugihara was driven so much, but even I can make a difference. Yes, he does say that he can change, he wants to change the world, but that wasn't his driving factor. It was that he saw something that was wrong. He felt it was wrong and he couldn't stand idly by. And I think those are the three most important things that if I were speaking to your students, that's what I would say to them. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, thank you both. I'm, I'm turning now to the Q&A questions that we've been getting. Um, there are a lot of questions about Japan, so I sort of have a three-part question for either of you to answer. Um, the first part is if you can speak directly about the museum in Japan, and the Jewish, the second part is speaking about the Jewish community in Japan. And the third part um, is a question about how the Japanese government's views on Sugihara has evolved over time if they've evolved over time. Um, Chellen, I see, would you like to go first? Uh, I am not as, I am not an expert on Jewish life in Japan. And I apologize for those of you joining us from Tokyo. I wish somebody from the audience could throw something up there and, and, and give us their personal, you know, um, uh, their personal experience with this. I mean, I say that I am Jewish by osmosis. My father was brought up Jewish he came over to Japan, you know, we, he was not by any means a practicing Jew, um, but, you know, Judaism was very, something that was very important to him. It was definitely a part of him. There's the, I went, we went to the synagogue in Kobe a few times. Um, I don't remember for any particular occasion, 
there was a, there is a very there was a very vibrant and active Jewish uh, community in 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 Kobe. Kobe is a port city for those of you who don't know. Much like Yokohama outside of Tokyo, Kobe is a very large port city. The reason that the, the many of the refugees ended up in Kobe instead of in Yokohama or Tokyo is because they're set, because Yaotsu, where they landed in Japan, is actually north. And but you've got what's what's known as the Japan Alps, and you can't cross the Alps, so you came. They came down the western coast of Japan and came over to Kobe. Kobe was the closest place. Um, you know, there was a wonderful article that one of the things that 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 really made me want to learn more about it was it came out. God, I'm going to say 20 years ago was it was an article in the New York Times about a New York Times reporter or, an, you know, a writer for the New York Times had gone to the Jewish cemetery in Yokohama. Yes, there's a Jewish cemetery in Yokohama. And she met a, an, an elderly gentleman who was just out there taking care of and cleaning graves. And she started asking him what his story was. And that and he told her that he had ended up in Japan because of Sugihara. And that was one of the first times that I heard about the story. There is a, you know, there is, there is a very active Jewish community in Tokyo as well. I mean, Rabbi Tokai, who I mentioned earlier, he went over there and he wrote the book, um, you know, the Fugu Plan. He went over as an Air Force chaplain, an Air Force Jewish chaplain, and then ended up staying or returning to Japan. And, and, and he was the, the chief rabbi of, of uh, uh, in Tokyo. Um, so that is about, you know, and now I've sort of lost my train. Sorry, I've derailed that train. What was the second part of the question? Um, the museum. Okay, and the museum in Yaotsu. There are several. There's a museum in Yaotsu where, you know, where the 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 uh, the refugees first landed. Mm -hmm. um, I have not been there. I'm ashamed to say. Um, I've been meaning to go the last couple of years, but we know what's happened in the last year. Uh, but he's celebrated very much. He's celebrated as a hero. It's and um, it is it is quite active. Um, and then there is also a small museum now in Tokyo, right near Tokyo Station. And it's called the Senpo Museum. And it's actually run by Madoka uh, Sugihara, who is uh, Sugihara's granddaughter um, by, his old, by his eldest son, Roki, and, and uh, uh, his widow. Um, so though there are the two museums in Japan right now that are very active. And there we go. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Linus and I can... I can try and reformulate in the, the third part of the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, me neither. I, I, I didn't visit the uh, Yotsu Museum, for example, but there are there are several places uh, all over the world, let's say, including Lithuania, where Sukihara story is told. So uh, here in Kaunas, then Yotsu, then Tsuruga Museum, Port of Humanity, and then uh, recently mentioned uh, museum in Tokyo. There are some 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 activities in in Russia as well to somehow memorize uh, Sukihara. Uh, so so these activities are uh, going uh, on. Uh, on the other hand, since I have terminal disease and this is history, I know much more about uh, past uh, Jewish community in Japan uh, than recent one. But the past Jewish community was a tremendous, very very very. Uh, 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 interesting uh, phenomena in Japan because two of these great uh, traditions, meaning Sephardic tradition and Ashkenazi tradition, met in in, in Japan and and then uh, lived together, impacted each other, and then Japanese society. Again, from the point of view of uh, Sukihara's Winterdijk survivors, uh, the, the 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 testimonies, the memoirs would go that uh, Japan was something like heaven. First of all, because maybe of dif different scenery, meaning the hills, the, the sea, which is not so usual to <laughs> Poland or Lithuania, but at the same time, the uh, uh, open uh, hearts and kind hearts uh, of, of the people when they were, well, uh, uh, suggested an apple to take a bath. Uh, and uh, the bottom line would be, finally, we were treated as a people. Uh, this is this is very important for for the refugees when they entered Japanese soil. Again, they were going to, through Transsiberian Railroad through all Soviet Russia, coming first uh, of all to Tsuruga and then go, going to Kobe because Kobe, to my knowledge, was was uh, in Kobe was well organized Jewish community. And then the other activities were taking place. Some settled in Kobe, some some were going some other places. But Kobe took this kind of uh, 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 <clears throat> guiding role of the activities because the papers were 
were needed, the, 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 the final destination places were needed, support was needed, and, and, and uh, stuff like that. And final part of the question about Japanese government and, and Tsukihara, here I would be a nasty <laughs> person uh, uh, at this point, since to my mind, the Japanese government, meaning government, first of all, is a little bit, or not a little bit, too much in instrumentalizing Tsukihara, saying that, look, we have Chiyuna Tsukihara, an exceptional person, a hero now, they are saying that that he was a hero, he was was, was an exceptional uh, uh, individual, and that's true. But again, this exceptionality we could see only to my mind in the context. And well, that period, Second World War period, Japan was not the nicest combatic country, especially in the region. So having in mind this, this context, Tsukihara is even more exceptional. Because again, uh, when he was uh, uh, growing up and he was a student, he, he, he was camping with, with, with his fellow, fellow students and he was singing some kind of patriotic songs. Patriotic songs meaning uh, the Lake Baikal will be ours. So this is the, this, this very hard nationalism, the context, the, the, the education he received. And at the same time, he was able to say, okay, these are equal human beings. These are individuals in danger and I should do everything to help them and again he was not he was uh, to my mind he was uh, uh, japan's patriot but he was in a big let's say uh, coalition with with some japanese japanese activities and as a matter of fact in whenever embassies he was serving he had very tough relationship with Japanese military attaches. Let it be Helsinki, let it be Königsberg, let it be other places. So he was, he was, he was uh, again, acting a little bit differently. And now the Japanese government is, is, is trying to make this, this as, as the, 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 the highlight, the exceptional uh, person, but at the same time using it a little bit instrumental. On the other hand, <laughs> not to show myself being somehow anti-Japanese governmentalist or something like that, some activities in Konos also to, took place. Recently we opened a monument for Chuna Sukihara, but it was organized by Kona City Municipality. And again, uh, in, in front Front of the of the uh, Metropolis Hotel, where Sukihara actually uh, came and left from this Metropolis Hotel, but now this Metropolis Hotel is is uh, bought by Kona's city mayor. He he has a business plan, let's say, and voila, he is opening a monument there. As if this is historical truth. On one hand, on the other hand, why not before? Why now? When you have bought this <laughs> uh, this 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 uh, uh, hotel? So again, a lot of complexities here. Yeah. Yeah, great. And thank you for identifying them. They just add more information to the story. It's so helpful to hear. Um, another question for both of you. A lot of audience uh, participation are asking about um, Sugihara's name specifically and uh, why his first name changed during his lifetime. Well, it's not so much that his, 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 his name changed. Um, people refer to him as Sempo. You know, it's a nickname. It's like Richard and Dick. I mean, that's simple. It's too simple. But I mean, Chiune, as it is, is a very uncommon name in Japan, or it's not a common name, to say the very least. And it's difficult to pronounce. And even for the, I mean, it's not difficult to pronounce for the Japanese, but it's 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 an odd pronunciation, or it's it's, it's not a common sound, common name. And so, as most as many of people would know. Japanese obviously borrowed the, the writing, the kanji script from the Chinese. And the Japanese does have a phonetic alphabet, but also has the, you know, the kanji that they use. And each character has at least two readings of the name. And the first one that's chi would be the phonetic pronunciation. And then uh, would, and then there's, you can also be read as sen, which is a thousand. And une, the second part of his name, you know, is can be read as 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 ho, and you put them together, and it's simple. So I mean, it's it's just it's a nickname, is essentially it's a hell of a lot. It's a lot easier for especially Westerners to say sempo than chiune. You know, difficult to get your you wrap your mouth around that. That's just the basic, you know that that's the basic explanation. It's not a change. It's it's a, a real name and a nickname. Great, thanks. 
Thanks for that. I cannot challenge Japanese experts, and uh, Celine explained, and I, I saw in, in chat the, the explanation with, with uh, uh, transliteration, kanji, and, and uh, things like that. Uh, here, I may I, I, I may share some kind of one of the well part of the stories or or, or legends or stereotypes about Sukihara. It is said that at least to Western versions, let's say, that he changed his name after 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 the war when he was coming back to USSR, where he was persona non grata as Junior Sukihara. Then uh, from from uh, late 60s, he was working uh, in, in, in Moscow, representing uh, small Japanese uh, companies. And this is the, 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 the explanation that he changed his name instead of Junior Sukihara as Sempo Sukihara in order not to be detected by uh, 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 Russia's or Soviet Union special special uh, uh, institutions or, or KGB and KVD and, and things like that. But to my mind, again, this is part of the legend because uh, KGB and KVD, they know how to track people and even how to kill people. So <laughs> Junior Sukihara, Sempo Sukihara could not be a very hard, not for, for, for KGB on, and KVD, but at least this is also part of the explanation why he suddenly appears as Sempo Sukihara, not Junior Sukihara. Hmm. And a, a longer interview might include maybe more of these myths because I that they're very, again, interesting nuggets. Um, thank you both. Um, Linus, this question is directed towards you. I don't know if you've been following the chat box, but it's we have a lot of descendants of Sugihara visas on the call, which is just such an honor. Um, and one thing that a lot of people are writing us to ask is if there's any way that they can um, show their appreciation to Sugihara's family and if if there's a list available somewhere and a way to contact the family. Um, yeah, if you have any. You mean uh, Sugihara's family uh, descendants? Mm -hmm. So so maybe uh, Chelin would know would know better. We we have links and with Madoka and with Nobuki Sukihara, the last son of of, of Junior Sukihara. But but uh, well, we we are not the owners of the of the of these links. So so we have contacts. But but uh, as I understood, Chelin Chelin is, is maybe in more in contact. So maybe he can. Uh, explain. I think I think the fairest way to do it is that we reach out to them and uh, we will we'll get contact information and we can put it back on the on on you know on the, the on the uh, the Vilna website. I think that would be the safest way to do it. Uh, as far as the list is concerned, um, I know that that Madoka and her museum they have a list in Tokyo. There's also a list at the the Illinois Holocaust Museum, and um, I if you know I know that that there's a way to check it. There are several Facebook groups, uh, including Sugihara survivors, Sugihara, Sugihara visa recipients. Um, okay, that there are, yeah, so there are there are groups on the internet. I can even try and find a link and put it up on the chat. Um, and though that would be the best way to find to see the, to find the name on the list. Also, Elena, do you guys, Elena, do you guys have a full, a complete copy of the list in a database? Uh, yes, actually, we, we have the, the, the list, the copy of, of, of list at, at um, our, our uh, museum, but at the same time, well, it's, it's uh, of very uh, bad condition, our website, we are trying to, or we are renewing it, but nevertheless, there is a list according to, as, as it was done by uh, Chuna Sugihara day by day, or you can use it also in alphabetic uh, uh, order, so sukiharahouse.com, you can, you can find the list of all, all the survivors. So it is very easy to, to, to search according to the, the, the surname, it is, it is very easy to do. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, another question for you both. Um, this is a direct question. I'll read it. Can you shed some light about his family life as he was growing up? I'm wondering where his ideas came from, risking his life to help others, etc. What religion was he growing up with? Did he maintain that throughout his life or later in life? Challenge? Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> Door number three. There we go. Um, you know, as, as far as I know, I don't know the intricacies of, of, of his personal religious beliefs, but he did, he did grow, grow up Buddhist, um, you know, and Japanese. Um, and uh, he went to Manchuria. When he went to Manchuria, I think I know I've seen this question, you know, come up several times. But yes, he was married. He married a woman named uh, Claudia Semino Semenonova Apol Apollonia. Did I get that right? No, Apollonova. And uh, he was married to her for, I think, about 11 years. And that is when he actually converted 
or to Russian Orthodoxy. They actually had a Russian Orthodox marriage and he practiced. So you see in our film, when he goes into the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the Orthodox church, he crosses himself in the correct manner because, you know, he knew what he was doing. Um, was he a practicing? I don't know. I, I don't know how much of a practicing, you know, anything that he was as far as, as, as far as his religion was concerned, but he did, I'm not going to say, no, I'm not, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to fathom a guess on that one. Um, was there another part of that question? Well, that was great. Yeah. And Linus, yeah, that's, I don't know if you have anything to um, add. That's that's uh, uh, again difficult difficult uh, question again some some kind of researches or some kind of, of, of facts that that are uh, circulating. Uh, uh, speaking about the family, well, he was he was growing in a in a quite a big family with, with sisters and, and and brothers. His his father was tax collector, so again at least he or sometimes in family was used to the moving. That's why maybe he was not afraid of diplomatic, let's say activities. At the same time, he had some uh, quarrel uh, with father because father imagined that Junius Guevara should be a doctor, and he on purpose failed his exam because his dream was languages uh, and Russian culture. He was very loving Russian culture, and that is quite a, a, a difference. Russian culture as, I don't know, Pushkin, Lermontov, Dostoevsky, whatsoever, and Soviet Union as, as an oppressive <laughs> system. Uh, uh, and the impact on, on his behavior, on his, his beliefs, I, I would say that he was changing and he was grew, uh, growing within the time. Let's say his activities in Manchukuo and his resignment from the post saying that not, I am not supporting the activities, my government or my puppet government, whatsoever is doing here, because this is against, against the uh, humanity, this is against the moral uh, laws and stuff like that. And uh, uh, again, being an intelligence uh, 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 officer, but at the same time, very smart and open to the world person uh, from every experience, he got something. Another explanation is that partly he might be influenced by all samurai traditions. Mm -hmm. And in some exhibitions or in some book, we can find some quotes besides uh, uh, Chelin mentioned that I had to do this. The other quote would be that if a bird comes to a hunter for a shelter, he should take care of the bird, not to kill. This is this is the, 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 the usual law, but this, if it is a danger, this is if it is an exceptional situation, I am uh, applying my moral standards. And besides this uh, uh, marriage with Claudia Semenovna Apolonovna, uh, which sometimes is, is somehow uh, uh, Treat it as an important uh, part of Sukihara's biography. I would say it is quite important because, again, uh, uh, differences, variety of cultures, traditions, which which made Sukihara more available, uh, more 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 knowledgeable about about different uh, about differences. Another story, again, part of the legend, I would say, uh, there is a book published uh, by Soliganor, Light One Candle, and in his book, uh, he explains that he, Soliganor was, uh, was, was, was uh, a Kona's uh, uh, boy at that time, during Sukihara's period or during uh, Second World War in Lithuania. And in, in his memories, he is saying that, well, actually, on the Hanukkah Eve, Somehow he didn't receive from his mother uh, uh, Hanukkah geld. He entered to candy shop and he was just uh, watching at, at, at the sweets put there. And some kind of exceptional uh, looking person came in and started a chat. Uh, why you are so sad and things like that and then uh, Soligano replied that I am not allowed by my parents to speak with uh, strangers and then he said hello I am Chuna Sukihara what's your name I am Soli so now we are friends and I would give you some uh, uh, Hanukkah geld you will buy some sweets and then of course being a young boy according to Soligano he was uh, very satisfied with the situation but before rushing out from the shop he said we are celebrating the feast uh, tonight. Would you come uh, to visit us? And uh, it is said, according to Soliganor, Sukihara family came into this uh, Hanukkah feast in, in, in Kaunas, in Old Town. And it was also some kind of, he was very moved. He was very, very touched by, by this, 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 this celebration, by the ritual. So some explanations are going that from this also kind of uh, and emotional and intellectual, let's say, experience of Jewish tradition, of, again, cherishing life, cherishing cherishing relationship, uh, celebrating life as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I know that we 
vaguely just talked about Sugihara's wife, um, but there are many questions about her specifically. So just turning back to her for a minute, um, what role or influence did she have in his decisions, if she had any? Can you talk a little bit more about their story? And again, open to both of you. Well, it's it's difficult to, to speak about Yukiko Sukihara. Again, some kind of, uh, let's say, at least from my understanding, my perspective, a Japanese uh, stereotype would say that uh, uh, in, in, in a family, a husband, a man, Make, makes a decisions and, and it, it should be followed as, as a rule. But according to uh, Yukiko's memoirs, because she was one of the first publishing Sukihara's uh, story, uh, so even uh, at this very hard uh, situation, uh, they have a very long and difficult conversation saying what I should do because people are standing uh, outside the consulate building. It is said that even uh, Yukiko Sukihara, the wife, uh, first saw the crowd and then uh, asked, and then and, and sister Satsuko, she, the family was, was traveling all the time. Chunya Sukihara, Yukiko Sukihara, three children. The third uh, son was born in Kaunas again <laughs> in May 1940. So this Im important uh, place for, for the family as well. And Satsuko, sister of Chunya Sukihara, was traveling together. So she asked, and most probably the guess is that the photos is, might be done from Kaunas for, for about the refugees by Satsuko Sukihara. But it is said that it was kind of uh, Yukiko Sukihara's boudoir, the, the, the window facing the street where they first saw a crowd uh, around, uh, around the, the consulate. So again, it is, it is, it is an exceptional, again, uh, situation and it shows exceptionality of Chiuna Sukihara that he uh, a little bit maybe omitted the Japanese tradition, but treated his, his, his wife as, as, as an equal partner and they together made a decision, what, what should we do? Because where are they risking? Again, some, some would say, well, it's, it's easy to do for Sukihara or for other guys because they were uh, diplomats, they had a diplomatic immunity whatsoever. Again, here I, 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 am, I would like to remind that it, it was a Soviet uh, period at that time in Lithuania, uh, but neither Nazis nor Soviets, and they were the allies at the very beginning of Second World War, both started Second World War, not only Nazis, but Soviets uh, as well. So the best example in, 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 a, in a worst manner is, again, my mentioned Raul Wallenberg. When he was a diplomat, he, he had diplomatic immunity, but somehow he disappeared somewhere in, 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 in uh, uh, Russia's uh, jailhouse. So definitely the family, the family was risking having three children. Uh, the decision should be done together by, by, by Yukiko. So Yukiko was, was uh, uh, accompanying Chunya Sukihara during all his diplomatic career. And I, I was, the support at home was very important because as uh, most probably all of us uh, know, Sukihara didn't receive any, any support from his government or from Tokyo saying, yes, yet that you are allowed to issue visas or something like that. So a little bit, uh, he felt alone and the support I would say was very important. Again, I mentioned uh, Jans Weinterdijk, who was uh, issuing some, some end point or final destination visas to Curaçao and Su Suriname Islands or the colonies of the Netherlands. He also felt threat but he was not a, a real diplomat, let's say, honorary consul. So he sent his family somewhere to the village in, in Lithuania. If something happens, at least my family would survive. So I would say the role of, of Yukiko was important, but unfortunately is not very well researched and not very well uh, described by Yukiko herself. Again, maybe this, this uh, modest, uh, modesty of, of, of uh, Japanese character, Japanese woman that well. I, again, I was doing what, what uh, the, the, the wife should do to support my, my, my husband and to, 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 to help him. Oh, thank you. Um, Chalyn, I, I have a, a different question for you. Um, can you tell us about the characters, characters um, Irina Pesh and the man who worked as the assistant at the Japanese consulate in Kaunas? Um, what happened to them? And specifically about Arena, was, did she really exist as a real person? And if she did, what was her connection to Sugihara? Oh, Chalyn, you're on mute. Yeah. Right. Let's start, let's, that, that, by the way, I think is the most used phrase in, in 2020, right? You're on mute. But um, anyway, uh, sorry, um, I couldn't help myself. Anyway, let's start with Pesh. Pesh is uh, actually did not exist as a single person. His character is actually an amalgam of anywhere from nine to over a dozen uh, various 
Polish underground operatives that worked with Sugihara throughout his career or throughout his stay in Kaunas and as well as when he went to the other cities, the, you know, so several of them went with him or new ones were assigned to him. So there always was a Polish component. I mean, there, you see pictures of, 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 um, of Sugihara in, in another one of his consulates and there are, you know, Polish intelligence officers there as well. But we thought that would be too, con too confusing. So we actually made him one person, Pesh. And actually at, at, the, uh, at the screening that we had in, um, in Warsaw at the, at the Jewish Museum, at the Warsaw Jewish Museum, uh, a gentleman stood up and started talking about, you know, that was, my, that was partly based on my father. And on the third day of, of filming in Warsaw, uh, Boris comes running over to me and he goes, he goes, challenge, challenge, he's, he's the one playing Pesh. And he goes, challenge, 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 check out the, look at this, look at this message I get, look at this message I get. And it was from this gentleman that we met a, or a year later, a good year and a half later at the museum. And he had actually written Boris about his father and said that his father had actually been in touch with Sugihara after the war and actually had some correspondence between the two of them. That takes care of that. So Wolfgang, um, his assistant at the consulate. Yes, he did exist. He's based on an actual person. Uh, all we know about him is that, yes, he was left behind when Sugihara and everyone left and the Nazis came, the Germans came. He actually ended up serving in the Wehrmacht in the German army. And there is record of him having survived the war and I'm sorry, beyond that, I don't have the, the, the details at my fingertips. Irina is based, his early, the early Irina, his girlfriend in the film, um, in the early parts of Manchuria. Uh, yes, that's based on his, his, his wife, Claudia, that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, did she ever make it to Kaunas? Doesn't everybody, isn't Casablanca one of everybody's favorite films? I mean, it sure was for me. And yes, I'm taking this. There's some artistic license taken there. It is entertainment after all. So I hope everyone will forgive me for that uh, little dalliance. Yeah. And I think I've answered all three of those. Got to it. If I may, for, for, for a second, uh, since Shelin uh, mentioned Casablanca, now we are working kind of, of, of an image of uh, Cone as, as Casablanca of the North, so, so in, inspired by the Casablanca movie, because a lot of Casablancan <laughs> activities were taken here. Uh, and uh, one example, uh, Wolfgang Gucci was mentioned here, local German who was right hand of Sukihara. If we would take phone book of 1939, 1940s, that would be inscription Japanese consulate Kaunas Vajgan Tosti 30, Wolfgang Gucci, not Junior Sukihara, responsible for that the telephone number. But it is said that uh, was working for Gestapo as well. So Sukihara doing his intelligence activities, collecting uh, Polish information and using, uh, transmitting to, to, to Japanese government, using his channels to transmit uh, Polish underground messages to the West. At the same time, Wolfgang Gucci you know, under one roof is also maybe reporting to Gestapo. <laughs> Yeah, we you know we didn't want to get as obvious as 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 having Wolfgang having a, a a Nazi lapel pin and then at the end throwing it down and crushing it. But for us, it was you know um, for his transformation of being called a good man. For us, that was that was our transition, our transformational moment for for Wolfgang. You know, like I said once again, it's easy to say one did reason one did things because of they were driven by religious beliefs or God to believe God and you know belief in God or a strict adherence to a politics and, and, and a follower of, 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 um, of, of, you know, of, of Hitler. We don't want to be that simple, so. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. I feel like we can keep discussing for hours and hours, and unfortunately, we're bringing this conversation to a close. Um, we are so thrilled and honored to have some of Sugihara's family on this call. Um, Chihiro and Madoka join us this evening, and I, we would love to ask if you would like to say a few words now. Again, thank you for being here. Hi, um, may I start? Please. Yes. Um, uh, good evening. In, over here, I'm living in Thailand. It's good morning. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm very honored to be here today and thank you very much for these invitations. And uh, well, um, Holocaust is not things on the past and Sugihara, my grandfather is not figure of the past either. And without any doubt uh, of humanitarian, humanitarian that uh, we should uh, be very proud of uh, um, as a Japanese. At the same time, he was uh, even more than that. Sugihara was um, intelligence officer and tried to help the Japanese government and tried not to have the war. So um, still we can study and then we can share what he done. Mm, definitely. And then uh, we are doing that, especially my sister is organizing the museum in Japan near the Tokyo stations. It's not a big place, but uh, we uh, show many things in the film and uh, uh, had many photos. Uh, and luckily, my grandmother uh, took many uh, photos uh, since during the war. And uh, uh, so uh, we can study. And unfortunately, this situation, we don't have uh, many uh, visitors. Uh, but and after that, please come to visit us. Mm -hmm. And we can talk to each other, and then uh, we can share. Definitely. I know many people on this call are very interested in the museum, so I'm sure when we're all able to come and travel again, that's a destination for many people on this call. Yes, yes, please. And then especially in Tokyo, <laughs> uh, very close to the Tokyo station. It's very convenient. Well, thank you so much. My pleasure. Madoka-san, uh, Hello, everyone. So, could you please translate for me, Jerry? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, we have a very, very small museum in Tokyo. So, uh, no um, as she said, uh, uh, everyone, uh, we just, this is Madoka, and she's got the museum. Like, and as Chihiro was kind enough to to give us give her a plug as well, it is literally a five minute walk from the front of Tokyo Station, and, and it is a wonderful, wonderful kind of compendium of all sorts of facts and events and and things like that. But uh, the museum is a short walk from Tokyo Station. And for this summer, we are planning a very big event, uh, which we will be happy to tell you more about later on. And hopefully, many of you will be able to join us. If you're able to make it to Japan, please do come and join us for this event. We would wel welcome everyone. え、そしてあの、できれば、サバイバーの人に、え、招待をして来てもらいたいという計画を持っているんですけれども、え、コロナがあまりいい状況ではないので、our hope and desire is that once we overcome this the the coronavirus pandemic and we're able to travel freely our hope and desire is to be able to call on as many survivors and descendants of the visa recipients as possible and have them join us in Tokyo and bring copies. Those of you who have copies of the visas or any kind of memorabilia will be able to be able to join us in Tokyo and celebrate together um, once and you know once we're able to freely travel. <laughs> あ、ごめんなさい。ドイツ大使館、今あの申請中なんですけれども、あ、えっと、イスラエル、リトアニア、それからイスラエル、リトアニア、えっと、オランダ大使館、それから今アメリカにも申請中なんですけれども、えっと
And at the moment, Poland, Israel, Lithuania, and Germany, and uh, sorry, and Holland, the Netherlands have agreed to participate. And we're in talks right now with, uh, with, the United, with the embassies of the United States and also the embassy of Germany. And we've also reached out to other organizations throughout the world to try and come together and, and, and help us to celebrate or, or to put this great event together. That's it. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, if you have any questions, so please come. <laughs> I just... I just would like to thank everybody tonight. I'm, I'm Marilyn O'Connor. I'm president of the board of directors of the Vilna Shul. And I first uh, I have a few announcements. So just bear with me for just a few more minutes. This has been an incredible evening. Um, I'd like to thank Natty Hoffman for bringing uh, the story of Sukihara and Chellen to the Vilna uh, last January. I'd like to thank Mark Sokol for uh, our Havdala and remarks uh, at the beginning of the program, Stacey Rosenthal for uh, facing history, Chellen and Linus, uh, and our last two uh, speakers, uh, descendants of Sugihara, um, also Lynn Krasker Schultz, who put this program together, and Kate Krieger, who's uh, behind the scenes uh, with the technology. Um, I think that the uh, significance of this program is amazing. I mean, think about we have people from all over the world, many time zones, and really most importantly, across many cultures. So I think I know I've learned um, a lot tonight about Lithuanian history, Japanese history, uh, culture, and um, and this is what really one of our missions at the Vilna. And it's, it's extraordinary, really, to think about how the themes, uh, Linus and Chellen talked about, um, you know, what we can learn from what Sugihara did, that one person matters, that silence makes you complicit. These themes are more relevant today than ever. So um, I, I just really think that we have to maybe do a part two. I feel like maybe tonight isn't enough and we're gonna have to figure out how to do a follow-up program on the topic. But thank you all so much for joining us. Um, you have one more day. If you haven't seen the film, you have till 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow night to watch the film. Um, it's, it's, it's two hours, it's fabulous. I can tell you that when we had it at the Vilna in person, um, I looked around the room and nobody was moving a muscle. It's just the whole thing from start to finish is extraordinarily uh, wonderful. And I, Chell and I appreciate you so much being with us. Um, continuing with our, one of our major themes this spring, preserving memory and understanding identity. I'd just like to um, mention that uh, for Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is this Wednesday, the 27th, we have another important program at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time entitled Finding Matilda. This is about Matilda Olkin, known as the Anne Frank of Lithuania. Um, please join us to learn about Matilda's life and hear from a team of scientists who searched for her grave and ultimately found it. Um, so you can go to our web website, www.vilnashul.org to register for that program and check out all our upcoming programs. If, you did, if you've enjoyed tonight's program and you are able, please consider making a donation on our website while you're there. Your generosity will help us provide important programming and foster community and worldwide engagement now and in the months ahead. So thank you all for being with us. Stay well and uh, take care. Good night. Good night. <laughs>